The book of John, we're going to continue tonight. Part two of the relationship of believers to Jesus and to the world. This is where he's talking about being the vine and the branches. And I, and I love the imagery that we get from the Word of God and how it's, it's, it's so matter-of-fact, but yet so poetic and so beautiful in the way that it's written. You know, we're, as we communicate, maybe you're like me, I like things just being straightforward, matter-of-fact. Like, just tell me. If it's an issue, we'll move on. If not, then, then we'll still move on. We're going we're gonna to deal with things and, and, and go that way. And a lot of the Word of God is like that. But you know, everybody's not like me. Praise the Lord. Everybody's not like me. And so God, as he is, He's inspiring these men to write, He wants to speak to all of us. He's going to write in a way that communicates to our hearts, to our moments, to our lives. And I thank God for that. That he's not just thinking about me. He's thinking about all y'all too. That he foresees the future and says, I need to communicate with that heart and with that heart and with that heart. And how powerful it is as God brings all this together. It's mighty. It's glorious. So now we're going to be looking at John 15. We may go back over some of the things that, that uh, Pastor Vince talked about last week. But we're getting into this moment. You know, with the book of John, and I know we've talked about this throughout this series, about, you know, it's, it's about love, right? You know, John said multiple times, I'm the one that Jesus loved. But now we get to, to, to chapter 15, and, and Jesus is really turning that to saying, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Pastor Vince talked last week about how God is, is saying, we, he, those two commandments that Jesus gave, right? To love God the Father in your mind, heart, and soul, and to love others as yourself. The first part of this teaching was about loving God with all your mind, heart, and soul. But tonight we get to the hard part. Loving your next door neighbor. Loving all those other people around you. Loving everyone else that you've got to interact. We often say that ministry would be easy if it didn't involve people. I mean, look, be real, you know. These relationships that we, that we build and that we gain, whether you're in ministry or, or, or not, whatever your life is and those relationships you have, man, it's, it's dealing with a lot of conflict. And that's one thing that the Bible and, the, and God is not shy about talking about is conflict. We're going to talk about tonight about how we're to love others. And then we're going to flip that and say, but most of them are going to hate you back. And so we have to think about that. We have this, we have been called, we have been commanded to love our neighbor. But with the understanding that many of them are going to hate us for it. And that's hard. I mean, let's be real. That's hard to think that I'm going to put all this effort and energy into loving somebody and there's a good chance they're just going to thumb their nose up at me and cuss me and give me the finger and go about their business. I mean, that's, that's, that's where we're at in this life. But God didn't command the unbeliever to love everybody. He commanded you and I as believers, of children of God. Look, our Father is a king. He's the Lord of lords, the king of kings. And he's called us and he's commanded us to love thy neighbor. So we're going to talk about that tonight. If you'll turn with me now to John chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 9. We have to understand that remaining in Christ, the vine involves loving one another. Before we get started, let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, as we read your word tonight, let it take on greater meaning to each and every one of us as individuals than it ever has before. Lord, that you inspired men to write down your words, Lord, so that it would impact us years and years and years later. Lord, I thank you that your word became flesh in Jesus Christ. Lord, that your word is powerful. It is mighty. 
It is like a two-edged sword that it can cut to the bone and to the marrow. Lord, that it will divide us. Lord, that it will shape us and shift us. Lord, let us all make the decision. Lord, if we haven't done it yet, let's make the decision even tonight to let your word be the guiding light. Lord, let your word guide us in everything that we do, every relationship that we have. Lord, that we may learn to love one another the way you love us. All these things we ask tonight in Jesus' name. So in John 15, verse 9, the word says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Now that word abide, I think, is one of the most critical words in this. You know, the word abide means to come into agreement and also the allowance of a rule or a command or a law have place in your life. So it's not just, okay, I'm in agreement. No, no, no. It's, I have loved you, so abide in my love. Understand that my love is greater than anything and allow it to be your guide. Come into agreement with the Lord, he's saying. He says, abide in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide again in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. He's talking about agreement, right? So if you're going to abide in the, in the love of Jesus, we've got to keep his commandments. It's pretty simple, right? It's pretty, pretty obvious that we need to do that. But in practice, that's where we trip up. Like we, can, we, we take this great information and we, we put it into our minds and then we filter out some of it, you know, before it gets to our heart. And we kind of place it over here and we scatter it. And then, then we're proud of ourselves when, when, when something happens and we don't get angry and, and don't have wrath upon our brothers and sisters. He said, no, abide in love just as I have abided. And he's given us the example. He only did what God the Father sent him to do. He only said what God the Father gave him to say let us align ourselves with that that we abide in his love verse 11 says these things i have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full this is my commandment that you love one another as i have loved you greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends Greater love than laid on their life for their friends. Man, we have taken a word. The word says that a true friend is closer than a brother. How many of them friends on Facebook you got you'd die for? We're good at that. We take words that mean something, you know, as people, we distort them. Man, we, we've, we've, really, we've really thinned down the meaning of the word friend. I, and I understand, look, Facebook wouldn't be so popular if it was sending acquaintance requests. <laughs> but we've got to be real about it. Most of the people on our Facebook pages are acquaintances. Many of them we've never even met. But they know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that we know. I think we should take back the meaning of the, that true word friend. You know, because I want a friend that's willing to go the mile. I got a friend. Now, you said, great, do I have to die for them? No. It's not about laying down your life in death necessarily. But do you have friends close to you that you would put your life on hold to go help them out when they have a problem? Would you sacrifice your bank account to help them? Like, how many friends... That, that, that circle begins to get small, doesn't it? So we're on Facebook, and there's 3,000 of them. And then we really start thinking about it. How many of them would I, would I go into debt for? How many of them would I say, you know, I got a mortgage payment due, but they got a problem. I'll let that slide for a little while. How many of them? Oh, that circle gets small. How many of them, when you're on vacation, and you get a call that somebody's sick, you're going to leave your family on vacation and come back home and take care of them? That circle's getting small now. How 
How many friends do you have that if they needed a kidney, you'd be the first one there if you're blood type matched? Man, that circle's small. You say, well, I'll do that for my family. I'll do that, you know, my kids, my, my wife, my, my family. But God's talking about something else. Who are your friends? He goes on and says in verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So Jesus says, I'll call you friend. I'll give you all this. I'll sacrifice my life life for you. I'm just asking you to do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For servants does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Verse 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. Maybe you're in a place in your life where, man, you need God to show up. God was looking for you. God chose you. Jesus said, you know what, they're going to have some issues, but tonight I choose you. Despite your life, right? We have to understand that. Despite all of our sin and all of our stuff, the word says that even though we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He chose you despite your past, despite your future. He chose you because he loves you. He's showing us this perfect example of love. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. He's talking about going and bearing fruit. He's talking about going out and he's talking about making connections with other people, loving them in a way that then they are grafted into the, the kingdom of God, to the family of God, and that fruit becomes, I often ask people, what is the fruit of an apple tree? It's more apple trees. It's about reproducing, kind after their own kind. Now some of you may look and say, man, I don't know if I want to reproduce me. You know, because I don't respond to things too well. And maybe, man, you know, my, 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 uh, my love language is uh, it's, it's full of cursing. But God's saying, I want to get you to understand what love is so you can walk in love, you can operate in love, you can live in love, and so that when you encounter people, You're going to love them despite where they've come from, despite who they are, despite what they're doing, and love them so that they can then become fruit and become another apple tree. And there's this cycle. If you have your books with you, I love how they break this down in this cycle. We have to understand that the loving relationship that we have with God and His will and His command for us to love one another, it is circular. It's circular. It keeps going, right? We, 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 we never have a dead end with God. So as we go out and, and we encounter someone and we walk through this, and we're going to talk about these five steps in just a moment, but as we complete these five steps and they've been grafted into the kingdom of God, it doesn't stop there. If the process starts over and we just keep continuing and bringing more and more people into the kingdom of God. Because God has called us to bear much fruit. He's called us to bring people into the kingdom of God. He's called us to do that. And it's not... Just so they can say, I have salvation. See, God's creating a family. We have to understand that. Unfortunately, we we, we speak of evangelism often as just going out. And yes, it is planting seeds. And often it's it's going out and, and giving the good news. And it is that. But often we speak about it just going out and, 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 and the sinner's prayer. And praise God for that. But we also have to understand that the love of God is to bring us together. See, God's building a kingdom. He's building a family so that we operate together in that. Because in mass, we can change the world. We, we, we like to make it singular, right? One church can change the world, amen. One person, each one of you are world changers, absolutely, 100%. But together... Together, 
we can change the world. So let's talk about this cycle. The first part of this cycle, and the number one, is that God loves us. We've got to understand that. How many of you here tonight know that God loves you? Man, every arm should be flying up. Right? God loves you. If, if you don't know that tonight, let me reiterate it. God loves you. God loves you. He sent a son to die for you. God loves you. John 15, 9 there said, As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Come into agreement with my love. If you want to experience the love of God, and here's what I believe. When we're born into this world, we, we have a capacity to love but only as it benefits me. I don't believe that we truly, truly love someone in the way that God would have us love them until we give ourselves over to salvation and a relationship with Jesus Christ. I see too many people, right? The lostness of the lost. I was that way. I mean, I love you because of how you make me feel. I love you because of what you did for me. I love you because you're a good friend. When we come to the place where we can say, I love you because God created you. I love you because God has some amazing things for you. This outward love, this projected love, the love said, that God said, because I so love the world, I will give everything. That's the love of God. So we have to understand that God loves us. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. To lay down his life for his friends. And I ask you tonight, how many friends do you have that you would lay your life down for? We all want to be chivalrous, right? We all, oh, I would do it for anybody. Think about that circle. So we understand in this cycle that God loves us. That's number one. Then the second part is once we understand that God loves us, despite what I do, despite all those things, despite my, my, my sin and, 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 and my issues, then we have to love God. It's mutual. It's a relationship with something we're building. So I'm going to begin to love God. God had to love me first. That drew me into into the light, drew me close to him. Now I'm going to begin to love him. And he says there in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So how do we show God that we love him? We do what he says. Just like, you know, an earthly father, like with my kids, I love them, and they know I love them, but man, my love is a little bit stronger when they do what I tell them to. God is a father, and he loves us, and he's he's willing to discipline us. But this relationship that we enter with him, it's mutual. It's loving God as he loves us. In John 15, 10 there again, it says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So we come to this place. Okay, God, you love me. Lord, I love you. What's the next step? We love one another. Oh, do I got to go there? I'm good with this, God. I'm good with you loving me and me loving you. I'm good. You know, man, it's, it's a hard day at work. And, and when I get home, I just, Lord, I want to be in your presence. And I want to do that. Please don't put anybody in my way. With the love of one another. On the way here tonight, God brought this to remembrance to me. So we were coming down the road. Uh, so after I, I get done, I go and pick up my kids and I bring them back up here. And we had some issues and I had to be here a little early. So we're going down a road. It's 55 miles an hour. And I was doing 60-ish. I'm not going to go any more than that. And there was a man in a truck up in front of me. I hope you're not here tonight, but maybe you are. And I noticed he was going slow. So I put my brakes on, and I get right up on him. And he's doing about 10 miles below speed limit, about 45. He took that as an offense, is all I can assume, because he slams on his brakes and drops down to 20. Now, before we go any further... Some of you were driving like me, and some of you were driving like him. Okay? We well, got to be real about that. 
Now, here's the thing. Both of us were right and both of us were wrong. But we didn't gain each other's perspective. We didn't know where the other I don't know. I mean, maybe. Maybe something in his, uh, you know, something happened to one of his children. His grand, uh, who knows? And so he, he feels that need to do that. He didn't know that I was in a hurry to get here to take care of a few things. We didn't know. But this moment of contention happens. This moment of conflict happens. And with the other 14 cars that were behind me as he drove the next five miles at 20 miles an hour and there was no way to pass him. But God reminded me, are you displaying my love? You know, and, and I think about that. We often think that we only nearly need to display the love of God when we have a face-to-face -face interaction. But in those moments, when we get riled up, are we displaying the love of God in a way till we just say, okay, Lord, forgive me as I forgive him? Because God knows the status of our heart in those moments. But love one another. Love one another. Fifteen twelve. He says, this is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Now he doesn't say... Love one another. Mostly the way I love you. Or love one another as long as it's pretty close to how I love you. Or love one another. You got a little bit. He says love one another as I have loved you. You know, Jesus was one of the best at giving the benefit of the doubt. Unfortunately, we just give the doubt many times. Love one another. So I've loved you. In verse 17 there, he says, these things I command you, that you love one another. Like He's, he's repeating this thing. He's repeating this thing. Like we're, we're, we're supposed to be the church, the, the, the body of Christ, the, the light of the world. And people come around Christians and, man, all they see is hate and anger and shouting and yelling. We're supposed to love one another. We love one another, right? So we love one to another. The, uh, n number three is, is, is loving as individuals to each other, one to another. You know, it's easy to, to make this exclamation. We're going to get it because point four is we love others as, as, as a whole. We love other groups. We love other people. We love, we, we love others that walk on this earth, other ethnicities, other points of view, other perspectives, other lifestyles. We love them because Christ loved us. Listen, the world knows what the church is against Have they found out what the church is for. Are we loving them in a way that they say, I don't really care what they're against, but I want to be part of that family because they loved me despite who I was and what my views were. Can we say that? Can we operate in that? Love one to another. Can we, you know, the, the, the saying is that uh, he, he missed the forest for the trees. Well, in this moment, God's saying, look at the trees individually. I believe, and I've said this, and, and please don't hear what I'm not saying. You know, when you get people together, and they get riled up and they start tearing things apart and looting and all that kind of stuff. And I often found it interesting that a person you can usually come to agreement with. You can usually 
find on any, on any situation points that you agree in. You can usually make sense of the situation. But often, when you get a bunch of people together, they're just stupid. Like they get this mob mentality and they're going crazy and the adrenaline gets flowing and everybody's shouting each other on and, and agging each other on and they move and man that's what we saw in all these riots and this destroying of property and all these things we see people as a group and God said you need to look at the individual and you learn to love them and then I'll teach you to learn to, to love the group. See, Ephesians 4, 3 says this is what we should strive for. Endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. Well, we got to find unity with our brothers and sisters. we got to find unity as we move forward. We're bound to it. Colossians 3, 14 says, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We often, we often say in, in leadership, if you strive for perfection, you'll hit excellent every time. Love is the bond of perfection. So any of you that have that, that trait, man, everything's got to be perfect all the time. Just can't, I can't go to sleep if that thing's out of order. I can't, I can't move on from that project if it's not perfect. I believe what God's telling me is love is the only perfect thing. Put on that love. It's a bond of perfection. So we learn, we learn to love that one, that, that individual tree in that forest. And then he's going to take us to a place where we can love others. Verse number four is we love others. Yeah, we, 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 we begin that God loves us. We, we learn to love God. See, God has to do that. He, he's not, he can't just magically place love in our heart and then we're going to know how to do all this thing. He has to take us and, I, and he holds your hand and he walks us down this path of, okay, I love you. Now, okay. That's good. Yeah, a couple, a little bit longer. Oh, you love me. All right, all right. Now, come on. Come on, Rocky. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Now you can love them. Oh, that, that person right there. Love them. Love them. Okay. Now he's going to take our hand. He's going to walk a little bit further. That we love others. See, God understands that, man, he pulled us up out of the miry clay. I don't know about you. When I got pulled up out of that clay, I was still dirty. Like, I didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't get pulled out and I was all clean. I didn't come up just bright white and shiny. Oh, I'm clean. No, God had a process that he had to take me through to clean me up. So with this process, this cycle, we love others. See, in John 15, 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So you're going to go bear fruit. You're going to go make relationships with people. You're going to begin to, to share life with them. You're going to begin to love them as God loves you. And then he says, and that your fruit should remain. So you're going to love them. That fruit is produced, but it's got to remain. And I, and I believe that what Jesus is speaking to here is, is the love that's superficial. Like, whenever we go out, and we go to minister to people and we, we make it a priority in our lives to do it. Are we loving them? Are we ministering to them? Are we touching them because we love them? Or just to check that box that I'm being a good Christian today? I believe we all kind of start out that way. I believe it's always, you know, God's, you know, God, He commanded me, so I better go do it. And that's how God works us into these relationships and actually begins to develop his love in us. Because it's his love in us that gives us the ability to truly love others. See, in Romans 5.8 it says, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you because he loved you. He didn't wait for you to get cleaned up. We have to be careful and we give this great, God gives us this great warning in Luke 10 about the Good Samaritan. We have to be careful. Are we watching? You know, Pastor Randy used to always say, walk slowly through a room. Touch everyone. Are we intentional about our love and about our contacts? And you might say, well, you know, 
what, 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 whether you're an introvert or an extrovert or any of those things, you know, well, we love to give titles, right? So all of us are a vert. And then we have, to, we have to figure out if we're an intro or an extra. But what I don't get is we'll say, oh, well, I'm an introvert, so that therefore I don't want to be around people. But God commanded you to go love people. And then you say, well, I'm an extrovert. I love to be around all the people. But be careful that your wife, who's an introvert at home, you're not leaving her behind. God has called us to look both ways. In the story in Luke 10 about the Samaritan, he was, he was, he was hurt, he was broke, he was bandaged. And he was stuck in a place. And all the religious people, all the high and mighty just walked right past him. Are we looking for people to love? Like, I, I believe as we, as, we, as, it, as we awake in the morning, Lord, put someone in front of me to love. Put someone in, in front of me that is not being loved. Lord, show me who needs to be loved. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go, find the hurting, find the hopeless, find the the distraught, find those that are in the ditch that are nasty and dirty and bleeding and bandaged up, and you be the one who bandages them. You be the one who helps raise them up. You be the one that sees them made whole. So we get to this place, and in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Right, we, 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 we come in here on Sundays and we're praying and we're believing and we're, and we're shouting to the rooftops and, and we're, oh, we're, we're praying in our heavenly language and we're doing all these things. But just like I spoke about uh, when we did the, the series on, on Dress to Kill, some of us are wearing two different types of armor. Some of us are coming in on Sundays wearing the polished stuff, the nice shiny stuff, but then whenever we go out on the on, on, to our work days, when we go out the next week, we take all that armor off and we're just Joe Plummer. You know, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not lug, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. That's just annoying. What he's saying right there is, you come to church on Sundays and man, you're, 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 you're moving in the Holy Spirit. You're making a connection and you're praying in your heavenly language and, and all this is awesome. But then you leave out on Monday and you come across people and, you, and, and, and man, you don't even look twice at them. And, 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 you, and you leave them alone and man, you get upset and you distraught. He said, that's as annoying to God as a clanging cymbal. And if it annoys God that way, how does it make that person that you work with that you've invited them to church 50 times and they finally came one Sunday and they saw you, man, just giving it your all in praise and worship, amen in every bold statement that that Dr. Ron gives, but then on Monday or Tuesday, they see no aspect of a walk with Christ in our lives. And that's a clanging symbol right up beside their ear. So we come to this place now. The next point in this, this circle is that those that we love, those, those others, then they'll come to love God. John 16, 24 says, until, until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be 
full. So he's talking about as we move into this place where God says, I love you. I say, okay, Lord, I love you too. And he says, now go love that other person over there. I go love them. And then he said, now, okay, now you're going to begin to love them as a group of people, as, as, as this world. You're going to end up loving the world in a way that is greater. Instead of complaining about everything that aggravates you, you're going to try to find ways to love this world, to be my representative on this earth. And now as you begin to do that, those people that you have loved on, they're going to begin to love God. And you want to find true joy? You want your, your, your joy tank to be full? You begin to ask for others to come to know the love of God. You know, Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, he writes this letter to this church thanking them for their love of people. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2, 10, he says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. And this next one, the labor of love. Do we labor in love? Do we work in love? You know, I think about what we spend so much time with our kids growing up. And, 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 I, and I, I try to tell my, my, my kids this. I mean, by the time you're in seventh grade, you've got to know what you're going to major in in college. Like, they got a pathway already laid out for all these different things. And I think it's going to change 15 times by the time you get out of college and then many times after that. But we, we, we spend so much time in America today considering our labor, what we're going to do, what, what that title is going to be on our business card, all these things. And, and, and God's showing us right here, do you, do you put that much consideration in your love for other people? Do you put that much time, do you put that much energy in learning to love others, in growing in love, in, in your love relationship with Jesus? Do we put that much effort into it? I don't think we do. It's a labor of love. Sometimes it's hard. We do it anyway. Sometimes, you know, they say that if you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. I don't know that I believe that. I understand the premise. But even when I'm doing stuff that I love, sometimes it feels like work. Just because you got those things you got to do. That monotony, those, those, those hard things. All that. But he's saying, labor in love. Work at it. That's your job. Your position in Christ is to love others. And he also says, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus. In the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel, this is verse 5, did not come to you in word only, but in power. He's given you the power to love, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we are among you for your sake. Verse 6, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you may become examples of, this is it. Become examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we have had to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He's saying, thank you for loving people, being an example. I want to say thank you tonight to all of you for being an example and loving people. Like none of us are doing it right. God can make improvement in all of us. He, it, we're striving towards that. We're walking in this path towards this perfection of love that he is talking about. And real quick, so that's the cycle. Okay, God, you love me. I love you. I love him. I love all of them. And now they're going to begin loving you. That's the cycle of love. And then it's a repeat. Now they're in that same position. We keep going. We keep going. We keep going. But we also have to know that as the world mistreated Christ the vine, it will also mistreat believers the branches. 
So when you go out and you love people and they look you in the eye and they cuss you up and down, love them anyway. That's too hard. Love them anyway. When you go out and you love people, And they curse Jesus up and down. You love them anyway. And that's hard. Yeah, that's right. It's supposed to be hard. This life and death struggle that we're in with the lost and with unbelievers, it's hard. But I know that God chose you. He chose all of you. To be a catalyst in changing the hearts and the minds of the people. Because they see something in you. They see something in his church. They, 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 they see, oh, even though I spoke these things, they still loved me. Even though, I know I've said it before, years ago when we were ministering at a homeless community, there was a lady there. And we began to share the gospel with her. And, you know, she's heard it up and down in every way and 50,000 times both, you know. And she began to explain uh, to me what her and the father of one of our pastors were doing to each other while they were watching the Passion of the Christ. Sexually. You know, we talk about righteous indignation. Righteous indignation is powerful. But not when it turns into wrath. Like that anger builds up. Oh, oh my God, how can you? Oh, oh my God, how can you even? But it was the demonic in her that was trying to show that the people of God did not love despite the situation and did not despite and, and did not love in these moments. But there was the power of the Holy Ghost that allowed us to take a deep breath and continue sharing the gospel. Like it's hard out there, guys. We understand that. People do all kinds of crazy stuff. Many of us still do as well. I don't you know that or not, but we all still wear this coat of flesh. But God's trying to take us to a place where we can operate in love. There's one thing in the book, and I love this statement. And I want us to take this tonight as I close. We have a choice to make in everything we do and everywhere we go. And this statement, I I highlighted it, I made it bold. In every area of life, people love those who belong and exclude those who do not belong. What a statement. If we perceive someone as belonging, if we perceive someone as the in crowd, and that can be based upon all these prejudices that we have. You know, we all have prejudices, right? We we can look right now and see all of our prejudice. Y'all would rather sit over there than over there. You'd rather sit over here than than by Scott over there. We have these prejudices and we have to understand that. But when we're living this life, do we take the time to include those who we normally would exclude? The ones that we don't see fit. See, Jesus, he chose to eat with the tax collector, with the sinners. When he saw them, listen, Y'all are already saved. <laughs> I'm going to go over here. There's work to be done. 
And, and we come into this re relationship with Jesus and God's moved and, and maybe we've been doing it for a while. And I even, I even see some forms of resentment begin to grow in, in believers because they're, they're, they're saying, well, God, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel you the way that I used to. I, I, I used to come in and, and, and it was powerful, that the service was powerful, and I, and I just don't feel that anymore. And, and, and what, what, what happened, God? Did, did you retract from me? Did I, he's saying, look, you're already saved. If you want to continue growing and, and experiencing that, that feeling that experience of God, then it's, a, it's, it's time to get onto God's train. It's time to get onto His team and begin to love the lost, begin to, to, to love the hopeless and to, and to bring them forth. You want to experience God in a mighty, dynamic way like you used to when you first gave your life to Him? You begin ministering to the hurt and the broken. You begin going out into this world and, and, and loving people the way Christ so loved you. And you're going to experience Him on a whole greater level. It'll be so much deeper, deeper, so much more fulfilling in your walk when you begin to do that. But often we go, I just, I get, on, I get in my routine. And when, and when I'm walking in that routine, man, I don't want anything to upset it. I don't want to have to do anything different. I'm pretty good right here. And we, 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 we have, you know, those, those church words, lazy boy Christianity, where it's just, it's comfortable. And then we begin to slip in our prayer time. We begin to slip in our time of devotion. We begin to slip and lose that time. And then all of a sudden we wake up one day and say, God, where are you? And he says, I'm still right here. But I've got more for you. I need you to grow in your faith. I need you to mature in your spirituality. If we're going to see this world, we, we, need, we, need, we need believers of all spectrums. man. We need, we need the newly saved. We need the baby Christians. Man, we need the, the people who have been saved since they were born. We need all the elderly. We need everybody because there are people groups that God has called you specifically to love. There are people out there that God has called you specifically to minister to. And it may not necessarily be because they're part of your group. Some of you men in here who have lighter colored hair than I do, it may not only be the prime timers that you can minister to and can relate to. Maybe there's some youth over there who need a guiding hand. Who needs someone who's been through it to help walk them through the issues that they're having. Maybe God's calling you to begin to mentor some people that's outside of your people group. We talk about, well, I've got all this wisdom and knowledge how, and, and, and all these things that I've been through. How can God use me? Are you looking for people? Are you taking the time to go and find them? Are you expecting God just to drop them in your lap? God has called us to be intentional with our faith, intentional with our love, intentional with our relationships. There in, in, in John 15, he says he expects the, what, the fruit to remain. He wants us to fall in love with people so that eventually they fall in love with him. And we continue, and we continue, and we continue.